late. Uh, I've been asked quite a lot of questions um, about various subjects on foiling. Uh, what volume of the board, what size foil, what length of mast, uh, where to put the mast, uh, foot straps, like there's, there's lots. So I thought I'd make this video uh, 10 things to think about to get into as you get into foiling. Uh, hopefully it will answer some of the questions to the people um, who are just starting out and anyone who's thinking of foiling in the future this may give you um, a few things to think about. So this is uh, 10 things uh, to think about when you start foiling. Okay, number one, uh, foil size. Um, lots and lots of people um, ask me about this one. Um, to be quite honest, there is no specific. Um, however, I would say that when you start out, the bigger the foil, the bigger the wing, the better. Um, lots of different reasons. It means that you need less wind. Um, you are going slower when you actually get foiling which means that you generally will have a little bit more control and also if you do crash it won't hurt and you won't damage your kit as much. Um, it's also dependent on weight, um, obviously the heavier you are the more um, surface area of a foil that you require in order to get up and foiling. If you are lighter you could still use a very very big wing but you will get overpowered very very quickly and you will not be able to control it so it, it's, it's, a bit of a, it's a bit of a balancing act. Um, I found out, if you look at my video before, that um, trying to learn on too small a foil just means that you spend the entire time pumping and when you do get up you're going so fast that when you crash you, you crash and you damage yourself and, and it's just it's just not a nice experience. Once I got onto a bigger foil everything seemed to settle down, I had longer runs, I was able to learn. Um, so as I said there's no hard and fast rules but what I will do is uh, I'll show you the differences in the foils that I've got and I would say that for my weight this amount of wind, that amount of wind for this foil, that amount of wind for this foil and then if you was just to take off like 20 kilos you could probably just drop down one of those foils and go from there. So we'll start out with um, the first one and uh, here they are. So you can see here that we've got um, four foils and um, the one at the back is my light wind and my large foil, um, it's a Manta 84 which is also the Slingshot 84 and then we've got the Slingshot Infinity 76 and the Slingshot Time Code 68 and the original H2 uh, F wind um, which you can see there 84 which is the width and the 76 which is the width and 68 which is the width that means nothing um, to be quite honest what you're more interested in is the surface area um, and as you can see each one is progressively bigger um, the big one the 90, the 84 um, is uh, 266 square centimeters so what we've got is uh, the big wing is 2066 now my weight, uh, about 105 kilos, um, I can get that going in about 12 knots. Um, might be a little bit less than that, but I'd say 12 knots I should be able to get that going with a 5.7 meter cell. I can keep that going in probably up to um, probably 18 knots, and I'm all the way down onto a 4 meter cell by then. The water conditions are sort of getting to a bit more choppy, and it's uh, it just gets to the point where it won't go any faster, and you've got quite a lot of power in the cell. So when it gets to about 15 knots, they tend to drop down onto the 76. The 76 got a really wide wind range, so I can get that going probably from about 15 knots all the way up to probably 22, 23 knots, something like that. And then I drop down, um, obviously cell sizes, but then I drop down to the time code 68. Um, which doesn't seem to have a top end on it, it just it just seems to just want to go and go and go. Difference being is if I went out uh, in 18 knots of wind on the time code, I'd get it going, but the moment I dropped my speed down to say 16 knots, it would just drop off the fold, it would stall immediately because it needs an awful lot of flow for my weight. Now if you were 85 kilos, it would may, it may actually keep you going and you would actually get up and going on that in a little bit less wind. So it's down to you, but I would say in the initial stages of learning the biggest foil wing that you can go with, because you get up, you're not going very fast, you've got a chance to foil, you're learning. 
you will always keep that foil because you'll always want to go out in lighter winds and then you can actually add to it as you need to go on. If you've already got windsurfing sails, you can use a big foil with smaller and smaller and smaller sails. I mean, I've got a three and a half metre sail which I use in sort of, I don't know, 25 to 30 knots of wind. I can get going on it and it's not a problem. I've used it on the, on the big wing. Um, it wasn't the most comfortable, should have dropped down, but at least I did it. So biggest wing you can. Um, and then go from there and then if you as you get better you can just add wings as you move along and this is the uh, this is the 76 so it's 76 across but it's the surface area and the surface area of this one is 1534 so it's about 500 square centimeters less than the big one and then you've got the time code 68 which is again a lot smaller uh, that's about a 1100 the difference being with this one is that it's got an awful lot of curve on the wings and this one's got a lot less. So it's what you see, although these, this is a surface area, a lot less of it is actually producing upwards lift. So this one is actually slightly less lifty. Um, it's a little bit more turny but it does seem to be a lot faster. So if you was to... This is the original H2 wing. And this is it. They're about the same size if you look. However, this one is quite flat, quite turned down, quite thin and quite thick. This one will get going a lot quicker than that one will. This one will get overpowered a lot quicker than that one will. This one will go faster. So it also depends on the actual plan form of the wing. So if you buy different wings from different makers, then you're going to start having problems. So it's worth staying with the same wing. So, tip number one, largest wing you can get for learning and then move on. I would say a 2,000 square centimetre wing for a 105 to 110 kilo person get you going in about 12 knots. If you take 15 to 20 kilos off of that, then you can probably come down by 500 centimetre square, so you come down to about 1,500. And if you're a serious lightweight, about 65, then you might be able to get away with something like an 1,100 as well. But you will always want, if you want to go out in light winds, a big wing will always get you up and going in very little wind and you're having quite a lot of fun. It's also very, very flat water when there's not a lot of wind, so you can actually get away with um, learning and um, you can try stuff that you wouldn't be able to do when it's a bit windier. Okay, another thing as well is a lot of people um, that I've spoken to over the summer um, that are thinking of getting into foil and even people that have actually started foiling they they really are not getting the um, the difference between windsurfing and foiling and um, although a lot of the kit looks the same and when you're on the surface of the water windsurfing you, you, you're almost windsurfing it feels very similar the moment that foil lifts it is a completely different sport um, so I've made a little model here and I shall demonstrate um, in a second what the differences between windsurfing and foiling are and how um, different the, the techniques are and what you've got to bring in to your mind to, to get to understand how this is working so um, uh, apologies that it's not scaled and to paint it um, but uh, you know I didn't have a huge amount of time okay so we've got a um, representation of a windsurf board forget the foil for the moment just imagine this is a fin so um, obviously the board floats on top of the water we get it moving, gradually the uh, release point comes back until eventually we're planing. But we still have an inherent stability in the board because um, if you get uh, the nose goes down, it will touch the water. Generally, it won't be able to go much further and it will then bounce back. If you then get the nose going high, you can increase mass foot pressure, you can move your weight forward, um, you can unload the fin and get the thing moving forward and straight again. So it's got a little bit of inherent stability, so hence the reason. I've put the, uh, the balance point around about here. Uh, we do tend to operate um, pushing against the fin and we use our mast uh, foot pressure to adjust basically the trim of the board. So here we have the board set up for windsurfing, uh, back foot pretty much pushing against the fin and we would have our mast foot here and um, obviously what we do is we increase our mast foot pressure and decrease our mast foot pressure we're also able to move our shoulders forward and back um, to push the weight forward. By that, we also then, by doing that, generally we sheet the sail in, which will increase the mast foot pressure. So there, if we reduce the mast foot pressure, 
we would have to move our shoulders quite a long way forward to try and counterbalance. Obviously if the nose comes up too far we have to increase our mass foot pressure by sheeting in and we can move it back again. We can increase our mass foot pressure more and we can decrease it. So it's a static weight of the sail but the sail is able to be produce a downward pressure. We are able to move our body weight by our shoulders and our hips but we are usually fairly static on the board but the board is reasonably stable because if the nose goes down as I said before it will touch the water it will stop it going any further it will generally bounce back if it goes too high we can sheet in but what we're doing is generally the board is running flat and we're pushing against the fin to produce a sideways motion through the fin which will produce lift and that will then be translated by the rails of the board into forward motion obviously the faster we go generally the more the release point comes back so we then become quite more foot uh, pressure uh, in order to keep the board running nice and flat so as you can see also there's quite a big distance between the board uh, the fin and the mast track um, leverage has a quite a big um, uh, leverage is uh, quite a big thing on, on windsurfing so if you move your mast track forward um, you actually increase how much even a small amount will affect the board so you can see there's a lot more movement now because it's a lot further forward the same as if you move it quite a long way back you get less leverage so therefore you tend to find that you'll get slightly um, less force through mass foot pressure but the problem then is you have a much shorter arm so things become a little bit more um, unstable with you around the axis so you tend to find you're a little bit more squirrely but if you get the board perfectly balanced then you can see we can use our shoulders and our body weight in order to adjust our trim and also by using mass foot pressure to adjust the trim of the board but that's a windsurfing board okay so what we've got now is a representation of the board when it's on the foil so the string now goes all the way through the board and you can see it's free to move backwards and forwards and it goes to the center of the foil this is a representation of the center of effort on your foil this is your wing because this is what you're flying this is where all of the weight is actually being um, balanced into when we were on the windsurfer we were looking at our foot straps were so that our back foot was pushing against the fin and we were looking to use mass foot pressure to balance everything out and we had that sort of um, stabilizer of the water that would always if the nose went down it would touch and it would move back up if the tail went in and it would balance you out we've now lost that this is very very um, sensitive to weight so if you look yeah it's it's gone so now that will tip and that will go all the way in so it's incredibly sensitive to weight shift so what we've got again is our static weight which is us and this is our back foot and our front foot we can still move our weight by using our shoulders and moving our weight with our waist and we can you can see incredibly sensitive to all weight distribution once you get it balanced it's a case of staying incredibly still and then hopefully you can keep the thing flying along and then it all goes wrong and as you can see we have to redo everything So that would be a representation of us flying along if we were just surfing. We had no sail, no nothing. So we've balanced the foil out and we're balanced and we're flying. So obviously we now what we've got to do is we've got to put on our rig. Okay, so there are advocates as well for um, foot straps, nose straps um, when you're learning. Um, I would say that in the early days, it probably is better to not have a back strap because you really are not sure where this is. Um, now if you put that there then that is that distance from the foil you're maybe not quite sure where this is here and where that's working and also how much lift your foil is producing and where your uh, mast foot is that is the best place so what you can be is quite dynamic on your board by moving yourself around and if you find that actually that's a really good place to balance everything um, then it may be, that may be the perfect place for you and once you've learned how that, where that is that's where you eventually put your foot strap. It may be that because you're on a windsurfer and you've got quite a, a long way forward mast track you may 
have to actually be like this. Um, but you'll be able to find out because you can genuinely move your foot around and find out where you are. If you're going along and the board just doesn't want to lift, it doesn't want to lift, it doesn't want to lift, well, you can move your foot back and then maybe that will work. Um, obviously, the front foot, if you don't have any straps at all, then you can move around. But in the early days, then you do tend to find that you want to start pumping and having a foot strap is, is, uh, is preferable. I just want to show you the um, thing about the leverage. So let's get all this uh, balance back up again. And so there we are. We've got it balanced. We've got ourselves in a nice position. So what we're going to do is we're going to move our mast foot forward. This is a tiny little weight compared to all of this. So in order to get that to balance, as you can see, it's almost double the distance because you've now got this distance, you've got this leverage, this this leverage is able to then exert a huge amount around the, the pivot point. So that's why if you use a heavy rig, you're gonna to need to have quite a lot of back foot pressure or move everything back. If you sheet in hard, then, and you're using, say for example, uh, quite a powerful cambered sail, you're gonna have an awful lot of pressure going through the nose. It's not gonna, um, it's not gonna to wanna to rise. The same thing is if you have a lot of weight on your back foot and then it does actually rise, what you've now got is you've got the foil pointing upwards, it's gonna to wanna to lift all the time. And as soon as it starts to lift, you then try to then bring your weight forward by pushing your shoulders. You're now basically one footed. You've got no weight on your back foot. You're pushing through on your front foot here. It's almost over the foil. You now get this pivot motion. So you're now gonna get a very, very squirrely foil. It's gonna to wanna to squirrel around. It's gonna to wanna to twist and turn. And, and you're just trying to balance these massive forces. If you bring everything reasonably close together, then you find that actually things tend to sort of smooth out and become a little bit more manageable. Um, leverage is a huge problem with, with foiling. You, you really have to be careful of where those kilograms are going, where that force is going. Um, and that's, that's one of the things about, I think, having your mast track, your mast foot, a little bit closer to your body as well. It also brings everything close to this pivot point and that just means it's a little bit easier for you to control everything. It's one less thing to think about. Um, also with regards to balancing the foil on the fuselage, um, obviously the fuselage is connected to the mast and the mast is connected to the box that you've got. Now it may be a tuttle box, it may be a movable type track box um, such as like the Nash. Um, or the fanatic type of thing. Um, so what you, it still just boils down to how you position everything to get your body weight going straight down the center of the board into the center of the foil. Now obviously this is very basic, this is, this, it may, your center of lift may be here, maybe there, maybe in the center, but you, you will have to figure that one out for yourself. And that's just about riding. So as the board, if the board constantly keeps on um, lifting then you need to move your foil back if the foil will not rise at all then you need to move your foil forward now on my board I have sliding mast track so I can actually move all of this forward so I can move my center of pressure for my center of lift forward if you haven't got that for example you've got a tuttle box you cannot move that track that mast at all so there has to be a way of you doing it so with the slingshot switch views what you can do is you can put this here and what that actually does is moves everything back or you can switch it round and you can put it in this position because it's switched round which will actually move this further forward so you've got three positions to do it if you can't move the foil then the only other thing you can do is you can move your foot straps so if your center of lift is so if your center of lift on your board is here and your foot straps were there, uh, there, the only thing you can do is move your foot straps forward, further forward. So it, it's a case of you have to make it fit to what you're doing on with your foil. Um, obviously if you're using a maker board with their maker foil, that it's probably set and that's where it's gonna be and that's it. And there, there's people who are far more skillful and intelligent than I am um, that have gone, yeah, that's where it needs to be. So, but there is still room for you to be able to move things around and fine tune by moving your foot straps further forward, further back, closer together, wider apart. You may be able to 
um, move the fuselage, you may be able to move the mast, but that is something that comes with later on. And it all boils down to uh, you set it up in a basic area, and I would suggest that that's how you do it. Centre of your foot straps, ideally draw a line through the board, and that's where it is. If you do that, you've got a place to work from. If the board is lifting, then you need to put your weight further forward, or you need to bring your uh, foil slightly back. If it will not lift at all, then you even need to bring your weight flight back or move your foil forward, and then you can do that, and then you'll get an idea for it. Um, what I would suggest you do as well is get yourself a, a marker pen. Um, if you've got a movable foil, is if you do move it and you find that actually it's working, get back to the beach, make a mark on it, because the next time you come down the beach, you can put it in. If you have, if you do take everything apart and you wash it out and you've used it on a certain setting, then make a note of it. You know, just just write it down somewhere, because obviously when you come back down to the beach and you do it, and then you can put it back to that and you can then move on from where you left off. Um, every single change you make will have a change. Move your mast track further forward, it will change the, fa the balance. If you move your boom up, it will change the balance. If you rig your sail slightly fuller, it will change the balance. If you move your harness lines, everything has an effect. And you need to be able to, right, what did I change today and, and what did it do? And there will be so much going on in your mind um, that in the end you'll still start to lose it. So ideally you want to always set it up exactly the same as the last time and then you can work from there and move on. Okay, so three is um, boom height. People are asking me what do what height is my boom um, when I I'm out um, foiling. I would say that in order to make things as easy as possible when you're first learning to foil, if you've already been windsurfing, I would just keep everything the same. Keep your boom at the same height as you're used to. Keep your harness line to the same length as you're used to. There'll be so many other things that are going on in your mind that you're trying to learn. That one less thing that you have to think, oh, is that going to be different, the better. So if you're, if you're used to a chest high boom and, and harness lines, are this, just stay with it, okay, because you're used to that already. As you get better, then you will start to understand and feel um, what is what is different, what you might be able to do, do I want it high, do I want it lower. I, I was sailing with a very, very high boom to start with and it was holding me back and I didn't realise until much later and I couldn't get used to the harness lines and, and I spent probably eight months, nine months without even being in the harness lines and then once I actually clicked where my boom height was would be, which wasn't actually far off what I used to windsurf with, all of a sudden everything sort of clicked into place. So I would say um, the boom height, if you're already windsurfing, just keep it exactly as you normally would rig it, no problem at all. Um, should you be one of these super people who's never ever windsurfed before that's getting into foiling, I would say for the moment, um, about chest high, um, so just about here, and um, harness lines, so if you had your hand on your boom, your harness line can go under your elbow. It's it's a very rough figure, but it'll, it'll start for the moment. Okay, so that's number three. Or uh, rigging your sails. Obviously, it depends on what kind of sails that you've got. Um, mine are wave sails and free ride sails. If you've got a cambered sail, then your position of your center of uh, effort and lift on the sail is pretty much set. Uh, it's going to be a very powerful sail, um, generally a bit heavier. I prefer the wave sails because they're lighter, they're a bit more maneuverable, they're easier to uphaul. Um, the thing about it is, is that the sails are designed to be used in a lot more wind than what you will be using them in for foiling. Um, for example, a five meter sail, for me, wind surfing, probably looking at 20 to 25 knots of wind. I will be using that for foiling um, in sort of 15, 16, 17 knots. It's a lot less. Um, and, and basically your, your sail has been designed that um, it will have a shape. It'll have a shape built into it. Um, the battens will have um, a certain amount of stiffness that will reduce towards the mast. That's designed to give it this this shape. It's been designed into it, but it needs wind in order for it to get this shape. So on a typical sail, as the wind fills it out, uh, it forms this shape. This is where the sweet spot is. This is where your centre of pressure is, and the lift, and this is where your harness lines will go to counter it. So you get this nice bow shape. If there's no wind, the sail itself will actually remain quite flat. 
and um, obviously that's not producing any lift at all. So um, what I found is is uh, with a wave cell, um, if you rig it badly, um, probably a good sort of five centimeters less downhaul than you normally would, um, you'll find it's quite bowed, and your uh, your battens will be pushing slightly beyond the mast. And also, don't put any outhaul on it at all. What you'll find is um, where the mast goes up, and there's this sleeve. This sleeve has got a bit of excess, and um, what this excess allows it to do is quite soft. It allows the, the bands to just pull out, and that will give you a little bit of shape, um, just a little bit of shape, and that will give you a little bit of lift in not a lot of wind. Um, and because there's no outhaul, it allows the sail to bow out. Um, what it means is, therefore, is that your harness lines, because this little bit of lift is quite close to the mast, uh, your harness lines need to be a lot further forward um, than, than when they would be if they were set up for windsurfing. Um, and as a result of that, because your harness lines are slightly further forward, you could probably need to bring your mast foot back a little bit. Again, because there's very little wind moving across the sail, um, it's very easy for you to, if you're coming from windsurfing, is to think there's no power. And when you do feel oh, there's a bit of power, it's not actually particularly good because what that means is, is you're actually oversheating and you're producing a lot of drag. Um, so what happens is, is the sail itself is producing an awful lot of drag. It feels like there's power, um, but actually what you're doing is producing a lot of sideways force and not any particular forward motion. Um, very inefficient and it won't work. Um, so you have to become very, very gentle and aware of where the lift is and where the power is. Um, it's, it's very almost finger tip. Um, so tip is is if you're using a softer type of cell, wind uh, wave cell or a free ride cell, is a lot less downhaul than normal, almost no outhaul. Move your harness lines forward um, and just be. Um, very aware of where that power is. When you bear off and you pump it will open up, it will give you that power but as you then head up into wind and you start to then move forward with the wind and actually start to move um, that, that air across it, you need to be careful. If you feel like there's a lot of force in it, you're probably oversheating. And what also what happens if you oversheat, because you've produced an awful lot of power through your backhand, um, that will then go back through your back foot which will then load the, um, the mast and that will give you spin out. So um, it is just a case of experimenting, but generally um, a softer cell, you will rig it really badly. Um, obviously if it's a slalom type cell with cams, then you know that is going to be set with a certain amount of camber in it, but you're going to have the penalty of that of weight. Um, it will weigh a lot more, um, but also it won't depower. So if you get a little bit of wind, um, you won't be able to depower the cell, so then you're going to end up with overfoiling and not being able to spill that power to slow down. Okay, five, uh, volume of the board. Um, you can use pretty much any volume you want. If you wanted to use a 60 kilo, a 60 litre board, you could. Um, the same as you would with windsurfing. You just need a, little, a lot of wind in order to get you up and you would only be able to water start. The beauty of this sport is that you can go out in quite gusty, lighter winds or fluky winds, and if the wind does drop, you've got the volume to uphaul and float home. So you tend to get out a lot more than you would have done if you were just pure uh, windsurfing on a slightly shorter board. Um, like I say, I'm 105 kilos, my, my board is uh, 142, and that's absolutely fine for me. Um, I can uphaul it, it never seems to feel too big. Um, and um, but it is a foil board, so it is quite short. Um, so it doesn't sort of suffer with too much being caught by the wind. But I would say, as a rule of thumb, um, about 30% of your body weight extra. So if you're 100, if you're 100 kilos, a 130 litre board will probably do all right for you. Um, because you've got to remember, it's not just the weight of you that's on the board, it's the weight of your foil, the weight of your rig, the weight of your foot straps. Um, so as long as you feel comfortable that you could uh, in almost no wind that you could you could uphaul and get home, then then it's the board for you. Um, so yeah, any, any volume can be done. If you want to go out just in strong winds, then you could go out on an 80 litre board. It's not a problem. It's not an issue. Um, but it's really it's just a case of what you feel comfortable that you can uphaul and get yourself home with.